Our reading for this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32. We'll be beginning our reading in verse 22. That's the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verse 32. We find these words. The same night he got up took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When this man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him in the hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, Please, tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. And so Jacob called the place Pinio, saying, For I have seen God face to face, And yet, my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I wonder how many of you this morning are fans of the music of Audrey Perry or Onika Mirage? Anybody? Maybe I should restate this differently. How many of you are fans of Faith Hill or Nicki Minaj? Perhaps that sounds a bit familiar. Uh, Musicians have this tricky way of changing their names to something more catchy, right? Uh, Doesn't seem very inspiring to listen to the music of Calvin Broadus Jr., but perhaps you'd be interested in Snoop Dogg. (laughs) Only some of you, right? Uh, Music by Stephanie Germanata doesn't really sound like an album you want to buy, but then, of course, you might be interested in an album by Lady Gaga. Now, it's not just musicians uh, who change their names. Actors often shorten their names or change them uh, completely. Uh, Norma Jean Mortison becomes Marilyn Monroe. Uh, Karen Johnson is Whoopi Goldberg. Now, oftentimes these name changes happen to uh, get to a name that more signifies the kind of public persona the actor is trying to portray. Uh, Other times, though, the uh, name is changed in order to avoid unnecessary confusion. For instance, did you know that Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film starred Michael Douglas? Now, you may be wondering, I thought it was Michael Keaton, but that's not what his mother grew up calling him. He's actually a Douglas, by trade. Uh, Fun facts next time you're uh, sitting around playing trivia. I I hope that sermon has been helpful for this, at least. Now, the ways that these actors and musicians choose their names, uh, they're interesting just because it tells us something about the entertainment industry, but it also tells us a bit about the personality of the the performer. And today, we have the story of a name change, but of a very different kind. So we're continuing our Lenten sermon series entitled The Call. We're in this season of discernment in the life of the church, gathering together each week in prayer groups to intentionally listen for God's direction in our lives. And over the next few weeks, Sunday mornings, we'll be focusing on stories, callings, and discernment in the Bible. Stories with themes about 
gratitude, confession, discipleship, and mission. Today, we explore a fascinating story of Jacob's encounter with God and how it changes him. See, as evening falls, Jacob is filled with anxiety and fear. He sits awake outside of his tent, uh, staring blankly into a dying campfire. He knows that tomorrow, when the sun rises, he will either find success or complete ruin. Jacob's birth name comes from the Hebrew word for trickster or overreacher. Fittingly, his tricks and clever cons are the whole reason why he is camping out on the frontier of the promised land instead of sleeping in a warm bed at home. Jacob was enjoying a comfortable life, uh, raising sheep on his father-in-law Laban's family estate. But it soon became apparent to everyone else in the family that Jacob was running a con to grow his herd at the expense of everyone else's. And recognizing soon that it was time to cash out as the family began to pick up on this scheme, uh, Jacob gathered up his family, his livestock, his servants, and he did his best to get out of Dodge. And although Levon uh, initially gives pursuit, eventually Jacob is able to talk his way into a deal that will spare his life and protect his ill-got gains. The only problem is that the deal Jacob strikes means he has to promise never to return to his father-in-law's lands. When God tells Jacob to return to the land of his grandfather Jacob, his grandfather Abraham, Jacob realizes that getting to this ancestral home means he must travel through the lands owned by his brother Esau. Now, if you were moving across the country, and you realized that the route you would have to take meant you would stop by your brother's house, uh, many of you would think there was no problem with that. It might be a, a good point for a place of rest. Unless, of course, you and your brother weren't speaking to one another because the last time you were together, he threatened to kill you because he, you tricked him out of the family inheritance, which is exactly where Jacob and Esau stand. Not exactly uh, model brothers and siblings, to say the least. And so it's all of these thoughts, of his past, of his future, of the danger that he's just escaped, of the danger that lies ahead of him, that are swirling around in his mind as the night grows darker. In the morning, Jacob will either be able to talk his way into a deal that will grant him safe passage, or Esau will finally get his revenge. Jacob is lost in thought. When suddenly, without warning, a man jumps out of the darkness and grabs Jacob. It tosses him to the ground. They get locked up in a heated exchange. But with the campfire completely out, there's no way for Jacob to know the identity of his assailant. Is it Esau, too eager to get his revenge till morning and snuck up on him in the middle of the night? Is it some evil spirit that lives in the wilderness? Is it someone else entirely, some bandit? Who could this attacker be? There's no time for Jacob to catch his breath or ask the identity of his assailant. He must exert all his strength just to stay in the fight and not be overcome. Hours pass. As the grudge match extends all through the night, 
And dawn is now approaching. It's clear that this is no ordinary man. It seems like Jacob is wrestling with God himself. And not just hanging in there. Jacob is doing well. Perhaps God has decided to be too vulnerable, too willing to meet Jacob on equal footing. The first ray of sunlight begins to peak over the horizon. The situation is becoming more dangerous every minute. Dangerous not because there's a chance God might be defeated in a wrestling match by a human, but dangerous because Jacob's life is now at stake. The ancient mothers and fathers of faith said that the fullness of God's glory, the unsurpassing mystery of the Holy One was too much for mortal eyes to gaze upon. Seeing God in the divine fullness would surely kill a man. And if Jacob does not let go, if he refuses to give up before sunrise, he will surely die. But Jacob is determined not to let go to hold on until he can win a blessing. He knows he faces another dangerous situation ahead with his brother. Perhaps this is his chance to gain assurance, to gain protection. Jacob is willing to risk death for the sake of divine blessing. Jacob's wrestling his struggling with God, is a defining moment in his life. This encounter will forever shape him and shape the lives of his descendants. And I don't think this is a story about God losing his cool and jumping David in the middle of the night. We're given the impression that this challenge is meant to test Jacob's inner strength to examine his character in the face of adversity, to prepare him for the challenges that lie ahead. Although none of us have physically wrestled with God before a major crisis in our lives, we've all experienced adversity that has tested our strength and faith. Not that they are induced by God, but that life in and of itself is not a matter of whether or not we will experience adversity, but how we will deal with it. As the writer Viktor Frankl once said, what is to give light must endure the burning. Put another way, there's this story from the Cherokee Nation about an elder who was once giving a lesson about life to his grandchildren. He he told the children gathered around him, a battle is raging inside me. It is a terrible fight between two wolves. One wolf represents my fear, my anger, my envy, my sorrow, regret, greed, and arrogance. The second wolf represents joy, peace, love, hope, generosity, humility, and faith. The old man gave a stern look at the children. The same battle is going on inside of you, going on inside of every person, too. The children thought about this for a moment. And one child asked his grandfather, well, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee replied, the one you feed. 
How we respond to adversity in our lives often depends on which nature we begin to feed. Whether we choose to respond with self-destructive behaviors or attitudes, or we choose to see challenge as opportunities for growth. Whenever I lead uh, premarital counseling sessions for couples, uh, I always tell them that a healthy marriage isn't about the absence of conflict. In reality, strong and healthy marriages are built through healthy responses to conflict. In every argument or issue, whether it's large or small, you have a choice. Choose to ignore a problem or situation or give in to strong emotions that lead to feelings of disappointment, anger, pain. When we blow up or we handle things in an unhealthy manner, adversity then causes these irreparable rifts, these resentments, sometimes breakups. And it's not that happy couples never experience these kind of things. It's the way that they deal with them that's different. When we're able to honestly express ourselves, to be vulnerable, to work through our issues together in a healthy way, we build bonds of understanding, of trust. We strengthen our relationship. You often learn more about your partner or spouse by working through conflict together than you do with casual conversation at dinner in a movie. When we respond to conflict in this way, We grow deeper in our level of connection. We grow greater in our commitment. A relationship can experience positive change uh, through encountering adversity. And faith isn't so far removed from that. Sometimes we experience moments in our life which we must choose how we respond towards greater health or towards greater sabotage. What are those moments in your life? Those moments that forced you to think seriously about your faith, about the universe, about relationships, How did you see God respond when you experienced healing or wholeness on the other side? How did it impact your faith? There have been many experiences in my life that have caused me to reconsider my thoughts about God, to reconsider what it meant to be a Christian. Those are hard experiences. But I'm grateful for who they shaped me to be. I'm not the same person on this side. This is certainly true for Jacob in our reading for today. Refusing to let go until he receives a blessing, he is granted a new name, a new identity. You shall no longer be called Jacob, God says, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with humans and have prevailed. And this new name means much more than simply what will be printed on a business card. The name represents that Jacob's strength, his capacity for struggling well. And it also demonstrates God's commitment to stay with Jacob in the struggle. In the journey that lies ahead, the challenges that Israel will face, God will be bound to this relationship. 
God will be involved in an active and engaged relationship with this man and the community that he will form. Uh, This is the good news in our passage for today, that when in our lives we experience challenge and adversity, we are not waiting for God to show up. We have assurance that God is already there with us struggling alongside us, working towards that moment of blessing. This name signifies that something new has been created in the world. As one scholar writes, new possibilities are open to Israel that have not been available before. In the giving of the blessing, Something of the power of God has been entrusted to Israel. This is a transformative moment in our story. The blessing that is received, it's not for immediate material gain. The challenges that lie ahead for Jacob still remain. He will still have to encounter his brother Esau. But God enables the promises for a future to be fulfilled. It is a promise that healing and hope have not been closed off. In the future, God will travel with Israel through times of challenge and times of celebration. And today, But we're reflecting on the ways God's blessings upon Israel changed the way we understand our own journey of faith as a congregation. You see, this process of transformation and growth can only happen when we have honest conversations about who we are, where we are, and what we're called to do. We all know from our personal lives that that journey of self-examination is not always the easiest one, not always our default mode. Discernment is not about the fluffy work of hopes and dreams. It's about soul-searching and life-changing encounters with God, a God who loves us enough not to accept the current arrangements of our lives who desires for us the experience of new beauty, greater love, deeper fulfillment. And that involves growth and change. But God promises to remain with us in this journey, in this struggle, to engage actively in our lives. So this week, I hope you'll take time to reflect on your own faith journey. Where have you seen the goodness and faithfulness of God at work in your life? What are those moments where you could pray, God, I never would have made it without you? It's when we recognize ways God has been present with us in the struggle, to to help us work toward that moment of healing, that moment of hope, that moment of blessing, may we respond in thanksgiving, in gratitude. May you give thanks for the ways in which you have seen growth and transformation in your own life. And may we be a church that is committed to wrestling with our calling, struggling and not giving up, that we might receive the promise and blessing of the new future God has in store for each of us and for all of us as a whole. Amen.